Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Washington's 5th Legislative District Virtual Town Hall. Joining us tonight is your 5th District Delegation, State Representative Lisa Callen, who serves as Vice Chair of the House Capital Budget Committee and as a member of both the Children, Youth, and Families and Education Committees. State Representative Bill Ramos, who serves as Vice Chair of the House Transportation Committee, as well as a member of the Rural Development, Agriculture, and Natural Resources and Public Safety Committees. And State Senator Mark Mullet, who serves as Chair of the Senate Financial Institutions Economic Development and Trade Committee, as well as a member of the Senate Early Learning and K-12 Education and Ways and Means Committee. Whew, did I get all of those right? <laughs> uh, Tonight, they'll be giving you a recap of the 22, uh, 2022 legislative session and answering your questions. Uh, first, a big thank you to all of you who submitted your questions in advance. If we aren't able to get to your question or if you think of a new one after tonight, don't hesitate to reach out to your members directly. We'll have their contact information available on screen at the end of tonight's town hall. And if you can't stick around for all of tonight's town hall, you'll also have the chance to see your fifth district delegation in person this Saturday, April 30th from 10 to 11 a.m. at Tahoma High School in Maple Valley. Uh, trust us, it's a lot more fun to host these in person rather than staring at a computer screen. All right, with that, we will we'll get started. First off, the 60-day uh, the short legislative session can often feel like a whirlwind, so much to do and so little time in which to do it. To kick us off tonight, I would like to uh, talk to each of the members if uh, they could give us a rundown of some of the topics the legislature tackled this year. Um, Rep. Callen, let's start with you. Thank you, David, and welcome everybody. Thank you for taking some of your evening time to join us. We're always anxious to talk to you in as many ways and formats as we can. So uh, deep gratitude. And um, we'll just reiterate what David said. We are um, always uh, anxious to connect and we'd love to see you on Saturday, but always feel free to reach out to our offices in every way. Uh, this session was fast. Um, we had it, 60 day sessions are always fast, but the, um, the unique thing about this session, of course, was the continued ongoing pandemic response and work that we needed to do and the additional revenue and um, federal relief and funding that came in. So there was a lot of uh, um, a lot of activity happening in the budgets and the supplemental budgets. They were larger and a lot more detailed and specifics of areas that we were trying to address than we normally would in a supplemental budget. So with that, we were very excited to be able to do work specifically around small businesses and economic recovery. We touched areas or certainly around K-12 education um, and what the not only pandemic impacts, but ongoing apportionment changes. So very excited about that. We did a lot of work in homelessness and housing, trying to move the dial on trying to figure out how to uh, provide some rapid acquisition and um, development of permanent uh, supportive housing and permanent affordable housing. Uh, we did uh, significant investments in behavioral health, both for children and adults. Um, I'm sure my colleagues will talk a little bit about some of the other areas, including natural resources, public safety, um, capital budget. You know, there's a, a long laundry list of what we what we accomplished um, and what we tried to make happen, not only to to address pandemic needs, ongoing recovery and pandemic needs, but also um, where the state is on several of these issues that I just mentioned and what we need to do going forward, how to stabilize our state and what the vision for our state is and how we move the dial on really making sure we're going in a place where we can make every person thrive. I should stop thank you. There. Well, yeah, no, thank you so much. Uh, Senator Mullet, how about you? Yeah, it was, I think it's the most productive short session I've had during my 10 years in the Senate, I think to me, the big story was we kind of got out of our normal silos of saying you have an operating budget, a transportation budget, and a capital budget. And usually our, our old Olympia mentality is if one budget's out of money and it's up to that budget to solve its own problems. What we did this time around is the transportation budget was obviously short of money, but the operating budget did send $4 billion to the transportation budget. So we could actually do a transportation package. And that's when I talk to the folks who work at WashDOT for the last 30 or 40 years, they've never seen anything of that magnitude. They've never seen a, a transportation package pass in a short session. 
and and we got two billion of that money up front, and the other two billion we're getting over the next fifteen years. But because we got the two billion up front, that gave us liquidity to do big mega projects such as finishing Highway 18. And so that to me was a huge giant success story from the short session. I think on the public safety front, we did do some stuff for the police in terms of giving them some additional flexibility to do their jobs. And we were able to do a, a pension benefit enhancement for police and fire. And I think that'll hopefully move the needle in getting those folks a little more engaged and feeling like they're more appreciated going forward. And with that, I'll turn it over to Representative Ramos. Great. Uh, thank you, Senator Mullet. And uh, yes, I would just add a little more on to that transportation package. Uh, that was a multi-year project and no one would think, thought we could get that through in a short session. And the fact that we did was uh, pretty amazing. A lot of work to uh, get agreement on, on how to put that together, what the priorities were, and trying to make that package have an equitable response to everyone and have it not just be a asphalt and concrete package, which is building roads, but how all the whole, the whole transportation sector needs to be addressed. And that's all the ways that deep people move about. And there's lots of different ones and through the multimodal, through, through you know, walking, biking, uh, you know, um, it's just a lot, transit. There's a lot going on in this thing, uh, this budget that uh, makes it different than most. Also the fact that it didn't raise any gas tax to fund it, which is the first time in the history of a transportation package as well. And we got our local uh, uh, things done locally that are most important to us, such as Highway 18. We'll talk more about that later. Um, on the public safety front, also uh, uh, from bills passed the previous year, there was a lot of discussion about them and some clarification needed. So we had four bills that passed that clarified things so that everybody was working out the same de definition. And these public safety issues were dealt with by sitting down with police officers, with police officer represent representatives from unions, from police chiefs, from the communities, from everybody sitting down together and saying, what's working right and what isn't and what we need to define. And we really need to clarify a couple of things. And I, we did that. And uh, we've been walking, uh, going around talking to many of the police chiefs in our area now. And most of them are very happy with, with what's done, that it's it really clarified things to make our, our community safer. Also, I'm always working in the natural resource area um, and uh, doing a pilot project in Lake Sammamish, uh, started by our uh, local Kokanee group that likes to protect our kokanee fish from Lake Sammamish. Um, and so we're working on a, a proviso that adds some funding to deal with the light pollution that gets into Lake Washington and lets the larger fish eat the small salmon when they're in their early life stages. We always think about large salmon, but they're all, they're all small fish at one time too. And at that time, they're more prey. And so how can we protect them from the larger fish that are hunting them when they're little? Because the water has a lot of light on it, which means the hunters can hunt all 24 hours a day versus just during daylight. So that's a big deal that we can look locally at Lake Sammamish, and we hope to build that in the future to go beyond that. So that's a quick little recap of uh, uh, some of the things we worked on, and uh, we'll go from there, I think, the questions. Yes, uh, thank you all so much for that recap. Um, all right, uh, Rep. Ramos, you drew the short straw before we began tonight, so the first question is going to you first. Um, we are starting to see signs of increasing crime rates both here in Washington and around the country. Um, how can we solve the increase in crime? Well, thank you for that. And whoever sent that in, I'm sure there's more than one person that did. Uh, it is a concern to, to almost everybody I know and it is also, also an issue that is not just in our area. It is around the nation. So it's not a localized some one thing. It's a societal uh, issue that's developing. And we're trying to deal with our ways we can within the state and local areas. And one of the first things we're doing is we all agree there's a shortage of police officers. And so how do we get more police officers? We don't want police officers to just trade from one city to another. We want more police officers. So we've been adding classes out of the police training center over the years, uh, which has been banned for. And at this point, we've uh, added uh, 13 new classes that will produce over 400, almost 400 uh, new officers in these next two years. That's a big deal increase over the amount that we've already increased it previously. So we want to get new folks into, the, into law enforcement 
that really uh, care about our communities, get good training through our training center, and to be active. Um, another little simple thing is uh, we work with Metro to have what we call our de-escalator provision, which is taking half a million dollars and helping Metro by having folks ride some of the buses that have uh, folks riding the buses that are sometimes causing a concern with others and safety of the driver and passengers uh, with uh, possible drug use or just things that shouldn't be done on the bus. And these folks are going to be trained to de-escalate the situation rather than calling the police, but how to deal with it, because they'll be riding on the actual buses and dealing with these programs. This is a pilot program that hopefully we can expand it as, as uh, success has shown. And, and so there, and there's a lot of other uh, things we're doing in the community to try to do that. But it is a, whole, a problem with all of society, and we need cooperation of everybody to solve this, including our businesses. People talk about how um, uh, people don't uh, get arrested for shoplifting. Well, some of that is the businesses don't prosecute shoplifters anymore. So if they don't prosecute, our police and our prosecutors can't do anything about it. So we need our business community to be good neighbors. We need all of us in the community to be good neighbors and work together to make sure that uh, we have uh, uh, opportunities to, when someone does do something that needs to be corrected, that we have the ability to do so and everybody cooperates to correct that situation. So it doesn't perpetuate itself because people think there are, won't be consequences for their actions. I'll leave it at that and let folks add more to it. Well, I think, I think public safety has kind of risen to the top of basically one of the top one or two issues that we have to solve from a public policy perspective. You know, my own ice cream store was broken into last month in the middle of the night. They smashed the front door, came in, stole the register, and and we're out of there in the space of 60 seconds sort of thing. And I think everywhere it's going to be contingent upon the legislature to come up with policies. I think this session between the pension enhancements and, and the fact that we did make some improvements to the bills we had passed previously, which had, you know, obviously raised some concerns for our police officers on the ground, I think it shows that we are listening to their concerns. And I think hopefully in the next six to nine months, we're, we're going to see some improvements on the public safety front. And if we don't see improvements on the public safety front before we go back in the session in January, my guess is that's going to be one of our top priorities to invest more money into because it's unacceptable to just not to let it keep going the way it is. We have to turn it around and, and make people feel safe. I, you know, I agree with Senator Mullet and certainly the work that was happening in the session. There was other aspects around, you know, crime and the elements of that and what's happening. There was, again, uh, investments around a co-response for behavioral health and also investments around, um, uh, I was looking at the exact title, the Law Enforcement Wellness Program. There's a, investments to establish a grant program for body cameras. I mean, there's a lot of elements that are individual items that were pieced together. They were hoping to see some significant changes in those areas. But again, it goes back to the full uh, community engagement, county, local government engagement, and how we tech and work with our businesses to how we connect with this and make this happen. You know, the, the legislature is also um, trying to really take a hard look at how we respond to substance use, how we respond to what does that look like in happening out in our communities? What do we do in those spaces as well? And we saw some action and some investments um, around that in terms of crisis stabilization and, and how we support all of that work. So um, I think unique pilots like the de-escalator program on our buses, I think other um, unique elements around how local governments are trying to address this with their communities um, and then hearing from our local communities directly during the interim about what from a state perspective we can do. I think it really in, requires us to do deep listening on local control issues to make sure that the state is showing up in a way that is supportive, um, especially with the changes that have been made over the last two sessions. Thank you all for those answers. Uh, like Senator Mullet said, I I would agree. I think that uh, um, that is top of mind for a lot of people right now. Um, all right, uh, keeping with Senator Mullet, um, the next question that we have, as we're emerging from the COVID-19 pandemic, what is the legislature doing to help small businesses that are struggling right now? Okay, that's a great question. I think the first thing we did is in the unemployment insurance tax base, you know, the unemployment insurance trust fund had $5 billion in it going into COVID. It went down 
you know, almost below a billion, you know, at, by the end of 2020. So in statute, normally your rates would have doubled or tripled to try to rebuild the fund. We did put some of our general fund money, a little over 500 million directly into that account. And we also acknowledged that this is not the time to try to rebuild the fund overnight. So we, we passed another bill this past session to basically give us more time to rebuild the balance of that account. So people's unemployment insurance tax rates aren't doubling or tripling. And that's the first thing we've done. We still have to keep doing that. When we show up in January of next year, we're going to have more work to do because we basically saved the small business owner from the tax increase in the 2021 calendar year and now the 22 calendar year. But we're going to have to still find some money to save them in the 23 calendar year. And, and the other thing, we we raised the threshold this last session of, of how much money before you have to file B&O tax. And so by raising that to $150,000, you before it was fifty. There's a whole bunch of businesses now. If you're a smaller business, you're just not going to have to deal with filing state B&O tax. And we think that's not only a good government issue because it is less burden, less bureaucracy, less paperwork, less headaches. It is making it easier for people who want to start a small business because they don't have to pay the B&O tax on, on the initial first hundred fifty thousand dollars. And that was a bill we've had kind of out there for the last decade, and it finally got to the finish line this year, which was good. I mean, also, um, you know, the uh, what was done there, you know, the, the, there was federal money that came through to help small businesses. And, and a lot of that instead, uh, the state used some of it uh, through our programs, but we also passed a lot of it to the local uh, entities to spread it out where they could see that and hopefully uh, have a closer hand on what businesses needed. Now, we know that some businesses still didn't get the help they, they deserved as others did. So there's trying to balance that out, but I think the local distribution of a lot of the uh, federal funding really helped get things on a, on a much better scale and uh, a clearer uh, way of folks dealing with their local city versus dealing with the state programs. Okay, great. Uh, the next question that we got um, in advance here was, when will the legislature fund school districts enough that local levies are no longer required? Um, Rep. Callen, let's uh, let's go with you on this one. No, oh, thanks. And you know, this actually um, harkens back to the McCleary court case settlement and the definition of what is basic education and how does that all tie together. And with the the current um, legislative state with and agreements with the court and settling out with McCleary, the definition of what is basic education is defined and the state is meeting its constitutional duty uh, to provide that funding and has to maintain that funding and the inflationary costs that are associated with maintaining that ongoing effort. I think the um, all of us argue that have been involved with school districts with me with my school board background um, and uh, we know that there are several elements of basic education that are not fully funded. And that's what this question is getting to and being addressed. And this again is a partnership that we still need to fight and work the advocacy battle um, with the federal government on fully funding uh, the IDA Act and um, making sure that we're really fully funding special education. And what does that look like? That's one of the major cost barriers to the state. The state this year did make um, one of its largest investments in the K-12 education program that it has made since the McCleary uh, settlement and the, the actions of the legislature from 2018 and before that. Um, and we, I think we invested like over 800, slightly over 800 million in long-term investments that will be ongoing. And that is increasing the apportionment for mental health counselors, nurses, school nurses, that type of thing. We also um, added and changed the transportation formula to cover the high expense transportation costs around special education, around students that um, are uh, qualified for the McKinney Vento program and are also high cost transportation issues for districts and taking that on. So adding some of those elements um, and into the program, we're you know we're chunking that up and and adding in more and more as as we can and state afford to completely get away from state and local levies. I think the LEA program, which helps kind of equalize the ability to pass levies across the state to make sure that there's you know equity across our school districts. I think those enrichment programs, paying for substitutes, paying for sports, paying for um, 
the lower class size ratios uh, that was passed in the initiative, all of those things are still falling underneath those levy dollars and there's still a long ways to go to make that happen. There's no big magic question or, or like, like I can't give you like in two years, I think we're gonna get there. Um, right now, the education budget takes up close to or nearly 50% of the state's overall budget. And there's still plenty of other things that we have to pay for, including public safety, including behavioral health, including, um, you know, all of these, the unemployment, you know, uh, stuff that we were just talking about. So we're a long ways off, but that's certainly one of the primary reasons why I ran for the legislature to begin with, is trying to figure out how to make that happen. And we'll continue to work on each and every one of those items to make sure that we've got our basic education covered and then making sure that we're providing all of the elements that we need to, to, to differentiate where we need to and try to help our local districts create that space and funding. And I think, I think there's a, you gotta be careful here because the beauty of local levy dollars is your local community gets to decide how to spend them. So Issaquah can do X, like Issaquah can do before and after school programs. Tahoma can invest in more mental health counselors. Snoqualmie Valley can do something completely different. And, and I think if you get rid of local levy dollars, you're gonna get rid of a lot of the local control, which is what people like about their districts is they can actually tailor programs that are good for that community, but might not be good somewhere else in the state. Our state dollars are pretty much focused on here's the teachers and we're going to pay for them so you can get kind of your core graduation requirements in. But we don't send out money for districts to do the fun frilly stuff. That really is where the local levy dollars come in. And I think if we were to get rid of those local levy dollars, you would lose a lot of the, the local flexibility that makes the schools the things that we love right now. So it's a, I think the, to me, the more important focus is the combination of, you wanna make sure you're managing the combination of state and local education dollars to make sure you're not forcing people out of their homes, but just shifting money from the local level to the state level isn't necessarily gonna to lead to great outcomes. I don't think for our kids in our community. Yeah, I certainly appreciate the, the the local control aspect of it. I think that's very crucial. Every district is not the same. Every district has different needs and they need to be able to address those and those local dollars is what you know allows them to do that with that flexibility. Um, there is flexibility with the general apportionment dollars to some degree, uh, but those really are going to meeting the basic education needs and, and direction. So I think that's a, an excellent point. It really is about balancing that line and how we're doing it and then creating, making sure that we've got equity across the state for those districts that cannot pass and do not have the property values um, and cannot pass the levy. So making sure that just because you live in one community, you're not significantly disadvantaged over another student that lives um, in, you know, in a community that's passing levies. Yeah, and just just want to echo that that you know, if everybody could pass their levies, that that would be great and it'd be more balanced. But I, I am concerned with, uh, you know, those places that maybe they could pass it, maybe not. It's always a toss up. Some places tend to pass them you know, almost always, and those that can't ever pass them. So that does tend to, to build inequity into into what each child gets. And, and our goal definitely is to make sure that uh, every child in the state gets a good, solid, basic education, and it doesn't change from district to district. So that's an important piece that we always have to, to look at for sure. Thank you all for those answers. Um, next question here, I think, uh, Rep Ramos, if I heard you right in your intro, I think you may have uh, already previewed the answer to this question, uh, but how much are our gas taxes going to go up to pay for the big transportation package that passed this year? Uh, Rep Ramos, uh, let's start with you. None. That's he got a softball question. <laughs> That, that, that's my <laughs> one word answer to that big question, none. Um, and that I, I did mention briefly in the beginning that this is the first transportation package that did not have a gas tax included. Um, and, and part of that is there's a number of reasons for that. So there's always the why behind the, the answer, right? And, and some of that is we know the gas taxes are high already in our state. We know that gas is expensive and, and that does affect different people differently. That price of gas for those that need it to get everywhere to get to their job that they have to live far away because they can't afford to live close. There's a lot, and, and so we really didn't want to increase gas prices um, to do this package. Well, we had to come up with another way to do that because that's how it's always been funded. We haven't ever had a transportation package without a big tax increase. 
Um, and as uh, Senator Mullet mentioned, we we found funding in other places. We, with a lot of um, collaboration and discussions, you know, the uh, operating budget and the capital budget put money towards this transportation package. We had the Climate Commitment Act put money towards this transportation package. There were some fees that went up for sure, um, but generally this is a, an amazing size package that we really needed. Everybody told me, please pass the transportation package. The one thing they never said was where to get the money from. And so we found it from some unique sources and gas tax was not one of them. And very proud of that fact that, uh, but that it still had to come from some places. And so, you know, when the, when the operating budget is Senator Mullins said gave us $4 billion, that's $4 billion that's not going to something that the operating budget would have spent it on. Um, so there's always that trade off. Um, but the answer is none. <laughs> I know. I think this was, that was one of the biggest successes of the whole session what was being able to do a transportation package without a gas tax. And I think going forward, I think it's very clear that voters have anxiety about gas and the price of gas and how much it impacts people at all ends of the economic spectrum. And so I think there's nothing my own three kids who can drive who are high school or college age complain about more than the price of gas. It's like, and so it hits people and it really is, a pocketbook issue that I think we have to be cognizant of going forward. And, and I think we've set a huge example of how you can get it done. And, and so now we have the blueprint and hopefully next time we need transportation investments, we can go back to that blueprint. And, and some of our other gas taxes like that came in before I was even in the legislature back in 03 and 05, the nice thing is those bonds will start to expire in the next, you know, five years and you can reissue bond like the the bonds that we paid off then you could reissue bonds without raising the gas tax and so i think we are getting to a point finally in our transportation funding you know schedule that we're going to be able to make significant investments without increasing the gas tax going forward hopefully Okay, great. Uh, and I will say, in fairness to Rep. Ramos uh, on that question, he did have to start off tonight with explaining how to solve crime. So <laughs> I, I, think, I think that sort of evens it out a little bit. Um, but Senator Mullet, we'll, uh, we'll go with you for the next question here. Um, what can we do to protect Cedar River Canyon from further industrial waste following King County Council's plans around expanding the Cedar Hills Regional Landfill and permitting the new asphalt plant? Okay, this is definitely the short straw. <laughs> 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 These are some challenging things that we're having a hard time figuring out how we can control from the state level. Uh, for the Cedar Hills folks, make a couple of comments. I think one, there is a county meeting, I think tomorrow night at six o'clock and maybe at some point we can put something up on chat and you know, the lot pre COVID, what we would do is we would pack Maple Hills elementary school with everyone in the community to throw, you know, to be the squeaky wheel and complain, you know, loud and clear that we didn't want an expansion of the landfill. And I think we have to do that virtually tomorrow and send the message to the county that they've got to start to find some other solutions here. Waste energy is obviously a clear solution, even though it's expensive, but that's a lot better than just assuming they can just expand this landfill in our backyard for all of time. I, I think the asphalt plant has been, I mean, the county obviously just recently approved it. And, and I think all of our discussions with the county were they just had a hard time figuring out legally how to block the permit. They just were having, a, I think, I mean, Dow Constantine, when he was on the council, I think voted against that plant way back in 08. But now as, as King County executive, it was like, I can't stop things that, you know, I'm not just going to do things that are unconstitutional against the law to prevent valid permits from going forward. And so I think the concerns there are valid. It's really hard from the state level to figure out things we can do to stop those things from moving forward. But definitely tomorrow night, if people have anxiety about the landfill expansion, I, I would show up in the meeting. And, and one big positive note out of the session was, Cedar Grove, there's a big giant composting bill, probably the largest composting bill I've seen in my 10 years in the Senate. And part of that bill basically gave Cedar Grove carte blanche to expand their facility without any kind of neighborhood permit review process at all. And we did successfully remove that from the bill, <laughs> much to the chagrin of a lot of folks. So that wasn't an easy fight. But when that final bill passed, it made it clear that it's easy to site and permit new composting facilities in the state now, 
but it's not easy to site and expand the largest facility in the state, which happens to be the one in our backyard. So they are still operating under their old permit standards. And hopefully, because the bill makes it easier to site new composting facilities, we'll get some other ones online elsewhere in our region. So it's not all reliant on our community to, to shoulder this burden. I think one of the things that we have to, to continue to look at at the state level and this composting bill that Senator Mullet talks about is a, is a classic example. It's the full life cycle and the full, you know, beginning to end impact of our waste, whether it's organic waste, whether it's, um, you know, it's uh, biosolids, whether it's our landfills, whatever that case may be, and how the impact is not only um, on the environment, uh, on our neighbors, what does that look like and mean on our clean air, on our water, um, but also the impact on just, you know, how it's actually being managed within each of our local cities and their view of it and how the impact is on the neighboring cities, the rest of the county, how does that all connect and tie? So we have to take in that full that full range. I think part of what was in this um, composting bill as an example was some of the lessons learned of the impact of the, the composting facility that's in the fifth, right? What was the impact of the design of that one as it grew over time and we've learned more about how to, um, how to develop composting facilities with less smell, less impact to the neighbors, and the distance from which, uh, you know, a, a compost facility can be sited next to, you know, other, uh, our neighborhoods, and what does that look like and mean? So we have to continue to roll all that together and making sure that we're doing the right things through our Department of Ecology, through our um, our clean air agencies and all of that work. So those are the, the areas when those bills come through or we're working on that policy, we have to make sure we're connecting those dots and and asking the right questions and make sure we've got everybody at the table that's going to be involved and impacted by those decisions. Yeah, and I'd just like to add, um, you know, it, it is difficult when, you know, most of the control for some of these projects are at the local level and we always fight for local control. So for the for the state to come in and, and do things, we can set some overall policy, but it's very hard to um, <clears throat> fight what, what is set up locally. But um, I just reiterate a little story because a couple of years ago, <clears throat> when the county announced they were going to basically punt and put off for 10 years to decide the question of, you know, what do you do after the, the landfill is full? And they were going <clears> to, <throat> excuse me, continue to fill it and wait till it was basically overflowing before they would deal with that question. Well, I personally called almost every county council member at that time and said, what the heck are you thinking? that is unreasonable to wait 10 years to try to address the issue. It's going to take you 10 years to probably fix it. You need to start now. And with that pressure that we were able to put on there, they then said, well, you're right. We have to start that process. And that's what they're doing now. So from pressure of the state, I think that we got them to start that process to work towards a solution sooner rather than put it off. So that's the kind of things we can do to, to some extent to help that. Um, to them to look for the alternative. Um, and that's, that's uh, one of the things we, uh, uh, you know, we, with those communications with local folks, we try to expand our, uh, our ability to, to get to a better solution for the community. Um, and and uh, regarding the asphalt plant, you know, you do have a local group that is working very hard to, uh, to put uh, um, appeals together, to go through the process to, uh, exhaust every possible possibility of uh, not allowing that permit to be uh, put into place. So that is, uh, know that if you're interested, they're around, you can join with them, but they are definitely exercising their rights as citizen and activists to do what they need to do in their community and dealing with their local county government in that process. And so you have a lot of folks in, in uh, community working for that and, uh, you know, join them. They're a good group of, group of folks. All right. Thank you all for your answers. Um, for those of you just joining us, uh, this is a reminder that this is a live virtual town hall with the members of Washington's 5th Legislative District Delegation. Uh, they are answering your questions tonight on the topics that you care about most. Uh, the next question that we got, um, We'll go with Rep. Callen on this one. Any updates on mental health or mental health services in our schools? 
There was a lot that happened this last session and certainly much still yet to be done. But I think that we definitely took large steps both for adult and children behavioral health in uh, the crisis response arena, as well as you know, long-term view and vision. So, uh, one of the bills that I uh, that I passed was to create a um, with uh, in conjunction with the Children Youth Behavioral Health Work Group, which that I co-chair, a subcommittee that's focused specifically on developing the long-term vision of where Washington should be on delivering uh, children youth behavioral health services across the perinatal phase all the way through. Um, you know, youth transitioning into adulthood and the level of service, whether that's promotion of um, well being and uh, prevention, you know, suicide prevention and all of the training and all of the health um, curriculum that we want to see in our schools, uh, all the way up through making sure that we've got the crisis response and then the recovery and ongoing well being supports and services. The pandemic really showed itself. Um, the holes were already there. We already had workforce shortages. We already had um, deserts of behavioral health services and supports across our state uh, for our children and our youth in particular, um, certainly for our adults that we see the same thing. Um, <clears throat> and the pandemic, you know, es you know, escalated all of that work and um, escalated and showed us the holes that we uh, that we already had. And so with that work and being able to quantify where we need to build the workforce, what kind of crisis response we need to beef up and, and respond. We were able to do short-term work where we did actual funding to add increase in fundings for um, mobile crisis units uh, across King County specifically. Uh, so you can have that with additional training for co-response teams and alternative response to help with first responders and our police and fire and invested in that. We were able to get a budget proviso specifically for a pilot for regional response for areas that are quite as dense in the Snoqualmie Valley um, to work on a co-response model that would go across jurisdictions and across cities to figure out how they could um, better serve their community in that regard. So we had a lot of a lot of work there. And then as we go through this long term plan and visioning effort, we'll establish a landscape analysis of what services are actually out there, what services are maxed out, where we don't have workforce, where we are over capacity um, and we have no network capacity to support our service, both from a Medicaid plan and also in a uh, private insurance arena. So as we go and we understand where those holes are, we'll know how and where to invest our state dollars to really fix that, um, to fix those holes. And that's where the vision part comes in, right? How do we make sure that happens? And then making sure we've got a strong transition to adult behavioral health care. Um, there is certainly capital investments that were made um, in crisis uh, facilities, stabilization facilities, and what we can do around that. So we did it both in the youth and the, the adult arena. We have 988 coming online, which is the um, behavioral health counterpart to 911. And as that 988 service comes online this summer, the state is continuing to work on through bills that have already passed, establishing all of the services and supports for adult care that should be connected to a 988 line. So if you're calling in with a behavioral health need, you can hopefully get um, services and supports, whether that's a next day appointment, whether that is uh, you know just a, a connection to a referral line to get you to the supports and services of a council that you want to see, need to see that's connected to your insurance level. There's a whole level of you know, layers that tie into that. Of course, I can talk to hours about that. My colleagues tease me about that. They they tease me even before I came on that I might take up the rest of the town hall talking about this. Um, so very excited about the investments and the attention that was brought to bear and the, um, the willingness of the legislature to invest in what we need to do for next steps there and looking forward to what's coming. There's still a lot to do, but I think we're gonna take the right steps to make sure we're investing dollars wisely and making a difference with where we're going. And the pilots are going to give us a lot of information, especially as we start to build out this co-response modeling and give our police departments the support they they need um, and deserve to have in how this is really showing up on their doorstep. Well, and I will add in really, I think one of my favorite bills this session was Representative Callan's bill that if you have a, that mental health is actually a reason for a kid to miss a day at school and that can count as an excuse absence, which I will be honest, I've been on the education committee for 10 years and I saw the bill come in front of me. I didn't realize that wasn't a valid excused absence prior to her bill passing. And so there's definitely good stuff happening. Uh, and I saw Janet, can I answer Janet's question in chat really quick? She asked for the bill number. 
yes, my compost go ahead. bill. And that was it's House Bill 1799 was a composting bill. And uh, people should know there's a resident in the fifth district, Elliot Paul, who the second one of these composting bills pop up, I, I, I'm on the phone with Elliot because he rallies the troops better than anybody I know. I've never seen somebody get a lot of community members to testify against a bad idea in Olympia as quickly as Elliot does. He's got some skills on this front. Well, I'll, I'll just add to that and back to the mental health is just that, that um, you know, rally the troops is that <clears throat> I'd say that we in the fifth here, have a reputation that when compost bills come around now, they better be talking to us because because we will we'll fight any compost bill that hits more into our district than we already have impacts. Um, but back to the mental health piece, um, what what matters to me is the big picture, you know, from the mental health side, we provide mainly funding goes to the local folks, right? To through nonprofits, through the local areas. It's it's the funding we can do. But the other and, and all those programs we can set up, but it's locally run most of the time. The one thing we can do and have been doing over the last couple of years is dealing with the lack of workforce, qualified folks to work in the mental health arena. And that's what's needed. And we passed some bills uh, just last year um, trying to build, uh, you know, we've got a new uh, school at the University of Washington. It's going to be a training hospital, 400 bed mental health training facility so that we can treat 400 patients and all the folks treating them are in training um, in, in getting more and more folks that are in that can be in that profession because that's the one thing we're really short of. Also on the college side, we're working with some programs that will encourage folks to, to uh, uh, that have benefits to t get into those careers as well as the professors that teach that to stay there and, and teach and get those folks. So that's the thing we can do in the bigger overall concept is uh, look at how we can uh, deal with helping the, the big need, which is in mental health, it's just, it really is qualified people to do the work because otherwise it doesn't matter if there's nobody qualified that you can call. So that's the big piece for me and trying that we can do is get those folks into those professions. And it was great. I was at someone talking the other day and she just told me her son's just getting out of his, his master's degree and he's ready to get into counseling. And it, she was just so happy and I was so happy. And I'd met him like four years ago. And uh, to know that, you know, from conversations, he decided that's his career. And he went into it, got educated. And now he's ready to go. So that's what we need to do um, I, from our overall standpoint. I definitely need to squeak in uh, because I was remiss of doing the school part HB 1664, which was the apportionment change and one of the largest investments around that space in terms of ensuring that there's more nurses, counselors, or any position funding that's related to um, social emotional well-being of students and that connection and physical well-being of students. So that apportionment will be an ongoing increase of funding to our school districts and for really the, um, the first time uh, since the uh, McCleary and maybe before that, there it was categorically uh, described and funded in the budget. So school districts have to spend that extra funding specifically on those positions um, so that it can't be used, uh, you know, a general apportionment that comes and then they can decide that they need to spend it somewhere else because we really want to build up that behavioral health support system in our schools to make sure that our kids have that support when they need them. Because if they're, if they're in a crisis, if they're in an anxiety attack, if they're um, they're not able to learn and they're not able to accomplish, you know, the core reason why school um, is there for them and why they're in the building to learn. So wanted to make sure and give a big shout out to the accomplishment of 1664 and the work that was done there. I think we're having a couple of technical difficulties on our end. But I think we'll go ahead and try and go for our next question, uh, which I think we'll pass to Senator Mullet, which is at the beginning, you mentioned some of the things that got done this year, but what didn't get addressed this session that you're really hoping to work on for next year? I think for me, my top priority for the upcoming session is going to be trying to speed up the building permit process. I think, you know, I do the state construction budget every year and we push out hundreds of millions of dollars for housing trust fund and to build more affordable housing, but there's not a single one of those homes that can be built without going through the local permitting process. And when you talk to people at the local level, they're jammed up. Like they're, 
permit departments are, it just, there's a lot of delays. There's a lot of headaches. We're really losing out, I think, on a lot of private investment dollars to build housing to other parts of the country, whether that's Boise or Austin or wherever. And so I really want to see the state, once again, going back to how we broke the silo, you know, between the operating budget and the transportation budget this past session, I want to see us break the silo between the idea that it's up solely to local cities and counties to figure out how to get their permitting part departments, you know, operating quickly. I want it to be clear to them that the state will be a partner and we're going to provide funding and we're going to try to find ways to speed up the permitting process. Cause at the end of the day, we need more houses. Like it's just super clear to me that the only way we're going to lower the price of housing in the state is to build more houses than what we're currently building. And, and we build about 45,000 new units a year. And that simply is not going to cut it based on how many people move to our state each year. And so if we want to get housing prices under control, we've got to figure out how to make it easier to attract more money into the residential housing space. And that's probably going to be my top focus for the upcoming session. And it passed the Senate this year, it did not pass the House. And so it's one of those things where you just come back and try again next time. Lisa, Lisa well, Bill, yep, I'll I'll jump in there a little bit. Um, one thing I guess to to let folks know, there's been a, a group working for a number of years now, and uh, hopefully in the next year or two, um, you'll be hearing more from them. It's our tax group, and what they're trying to look at the taxes in our state and the structure of them, and how they are regressive. Where you know the the person that makes you know forty thousand dollars a year pays eighteen percent. Uh, in taxes and the person makes $250,000 a year pays 3%. It's not a, a, a fair equitable tax system. So they're going to look at that. And people, if you ever talk about the B&O tax and that's on gross receipts, you know, it's it's a hard thing to say. You can be losing money and still have to pay taxes. That's, that's a unique tax to this state that I was so surprised when I moved here 40 years ago that, that, that doesn't seem fair losing money and paying taxes on your gross receipts and not considering what it costs you to, to produce whatever your product is. And the property tax issue that people are concerned, how high those are going. So how do we balance that out to, to be uh, more reasonable so people aren't priced out? Because even after you pay off your house at this point, your taxes are so high, they're higher than your original mortgage was on your house if you bought it 30 years ago. There's, there's things in the nature. So we're going to be looking at those things. They've been talking to a lot of folks, traveling around, getting ideas and what things we can do anyway, not trying to increase taxes, but to spread them out differently in a more fair and equitable way. Um, I'll also be looking in that arena of, of a long-term solution to fund transportation, seeing as the gas tax is not uh, where we want to add more uh, cost to, and it's not doing the job anyway. We, there's need more funding there and everybody wants transportation funding. So that would be a place to look long-term. How do we change our, uh, our funding of transportation so we can fund it? So everybody has good roads. We all want good roads. Um, let's work towards it. Um, and of course, um, the other things on um, forest health. You know, I'm always in that arena of forest health and, and, and protecting our nature, uh, natural areas. The salmon I'll be working on early life stage salmon, I'll continue working on that. But we do have to work long-term to, to take care of what our state is known for, and that's our forest. I'm really happy to know that the Forest Service is just starting to step up to deal with our national forest lands that I used to work for and er, have been not managing their lands well and causing some of this problem along with our state lands that we passed a bill uh, just two years ago to help deal with in, uh, bettering forest health and reducing fire risk and, fire, and trying to get away from these large fires, increasing fire crews, uh, and diversity of our fire crews, uh, ability to respond to fires quicker and better and not let them get so out of hand. Everybody wants to reduce that as well. So I'll be reading that right So those kind of three readings we're talking about, but we're working in a lot of these things. As you say, uh, you know, affordable housing, those kinds of things that are just so hard to, uh, to get a handle on because they're just, they're, some of them are really big picture and we can do, we can uh, adjust some on the edges, but it, it's hard when they're national and even worldwide issues to, to, eliminate problems. I uh, agree with the, the work needs to be done on housing. I think um, Senator Mullet talked about uh, building permits. There's affordability and access to, you know, there's permanent supportive housing, there's temporary housing, there's 
you know, how we're helping to navigate um, the homelessness crisis that we see in our state, across our state, actually, and, and how with that working on the capital budget from the House side in partnership with Senator Mullet um, has been a, a, a joy and a, a huge puzzle to continue to work on. And so I think we're going to be looking at how do we and having some conversations with our local governments again, a local control around what and how the state can help support um, and in what aspects, you know, you really want to, again, balance that local control and local communities needs and desires about what they want to do and how they want to manage zoning and all of that work. But it's going to be multi-layered and we really need to figure out ways to get more housing built and also um, more affordable housing. Right. And more uh, accessibility to that housing. What does that all look like and mean? So that's kind of repeating some of what Senator Mullet um, talked about, but I think there's, you know, a lot more to do there and the investments that we made, including infrastructure. So I think that's another area that we really want to look at. I do anyway, is really work with our, um, our local governments, figure out what's the infrastructure challenges that we see, certainly with the, the infrastructure, federal infrastructure bill that's coming through. What is the infrastructure challenges that we can support from a state level to help our local communities um, build out the housing that they need in, in a fashion that, that accelerates that build out and that growth um, and can provide that infrastructure in a way that is environmentally sound and protective, but also um, making sure we're getting what we need done. School construction continues to be a significant challenge across the state in terms of cost and investment and inequities across the state. We have pockets in the state where we have schools that are just, you know, are crumbling. We have a seismic uh, bill that we passed this last year, an investment to make sure that all of our schools um, will be starting to move forward and making sure that they're seismic safe, tsunami safe, that work. So those are all ongoing challenges from a capital budget perspective that we need to continue to work on. We made significant in investments and in leaps with the Fair Start Act for our children and our youth and in our early development um, stages from zero to five. But the cost and access to childcare still um, you know, we'll see that start to grow with the Fair Start Act, but there's still significant strides that need to happen. And there's some major um, results coming back in terms of the cost of care and what is actually cost to do child care and how can people afford that will be the next stage and steps around making sure that we can make that happen and that transition into K-12. And, um, you know, there's a lot of conversations around the early learning programs and the development there and the transitioning into uh, the um, the K-12 space, and then the same with the K-12 and the transitions into post-secondary, and what are the options, the opportunities there, and how do we think about um, 21st and 20, uh, 22nd century learning? What does that look like in mastery-based learning and those opportunities, and how do we grow that, and how do we make sure all of that higher um, post-secondary education or uh, career pathways are, again, affordable, accessible, um, we've got those apprenticeships and in internships. And then, of course, uh, we laid up the tremendous amount of foundational work on behavioral health. That's just the first step of where we need to go next on that. So those will be multi-year tasks and efforts. And I think we still need to continue to look at how we can um, really continue to do work that protects our climate and uh, turns a you know, green economy and figuring out how we can turn that in our state um, to, to the greater good for all. So we're always looking for the win, 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 win. And there's always these trade-offs and challenges and just working and talking with each of you on how that all spells out, helps us build, build better policy in those spaces. All right, thank you all so much for your responses. Um, I think my computer took some issue with me saying it was more fun to be in person than staring into a computer screen, but I am back now. Um, we are just about out of time for tonight, so we have one last question, and then we will uh, turn it over to the members for just some final remarks uh, before closing out this evening. Um, the last question we have is, I just got something in the mail from Senator Mullet saying that he's been working on Highway 18 for 10 years. <laughs> Why did it take so long? Senator well, Mullet, do you want to start think, us off? I think the challenge is every community has their own Highway 18. And so basically you're fighting with every community in the state who has a major road project they want to see funded. And I think we kind of, we caught a break when I got to the Senate, the Republicans were in charge of the Senate, but a little known fact that most people in this call may not know is the way Eastern Washington Republicans get to Olympia during session 
is they come over I-90 and then they cut down Highway 18 because they don't want to sit in traffic on 405 in the morning during rush hour. So they come over Monday morning. They saw firsthand how bad the traffic was going the other way. As they're driving to Olympia on Monday morning, they're like, wow, this is really bad. And then vice versa, when they go home on Friday night, they see the parking lot, you know, heading south on Highway 18 towards Maple Valley. So, you know, this has been it's a decade long process and that's just what it takes. I mean, it's $890 million when it's all said and done, we broke it up into pieces so we could actually get some progress. The very first chunk that interchange in the first couple of miles was, was $150 million price tag. And so this just shows if, if you want to try to do it all at once, you'll end up getting nothing done. So you have to break it up into smaller pieces and that's what ended up happening on this project. And, and yeah, the big giant piece was a 640 million we funded last month. And so now it's finally going to be complete, but, uh, having, we beat out a lot of other communities in the state because I think all the elected officials from Eastern Washington are very familiar with the pain of that stretch of road. And I just like to add to it, uh, you know, we say 10 years, cause that's how long you've been a Senator, but, uh, highway 18, a rebuild has been more over 30 years, almost 40 years in the making. Cause I moved here in the eighties when it was a two lane road the whole way. And they've been doing piece by piece, widen it to four lanes here, four lanes there, small chunks, sometimes showed up to me in, in the middle of, of, of a stretch, but it was the way they pieced it together. And we got lot left with working on the last, the last piece, which was what the toughest, most expensive piece, because you're really going over a mountain pass. So as you say, this last piece was close to a billion dollars. And, and uh, that's, that's a lot of money. And uh, we say, if we, if we get it, somebody else doesn't. Um, and it's just a continued fight to uh, to make sure we we our whole state needs more transportation dollars. That's the bottom line. And this is a piece that was critical. It was the most dangerous road in in uh, Washington. Uh, and uh, hopefully now that will not be it any longer. And it'll be safer because mainly it's not only going to go to four lanes, but it will be divided so that the head on collision part will be eliminated, which has been very painful for many folks. Uh, driving that road on a daily basis, not just those that come over once in a while. So it's, it's been a lot of uh, conversations and uh, this is where teamwork really helps. We work as a team here. I like to congratulate my two partners here, Senator Mullen and Rep Callen. We work together, we come at different problems, different ways, we share the work and we really get things done because we work together. And, uh, and on this project in particular, Senator Mullet was in the Senate side arguing for it. I was in the House side arguing for it. And th that that really helped us get those things done as as with Rep. Callan does those things on, on education and other aspects that we all take different leads on. And uh, it's the teamwork that makes this stuff get happen for, for the, everybody in the fifth and in the state as well. I'll just also want to give a huge shout out uh, with regards to Highway 18 and the journey. Remember, this is a major, major project and each separate little chunk and piece was major dollars and had to be part of a transportation package. It's not part of the ongoing you know, transportation annual budget. So because of the price tags and because of, there's usually bonding dollars that are you know involved and connected. So it really had to be a high priority and always be at the top of the list of all of the state needs and transportation and, and over time built to make that happen. And I think one of the things that we saw in our area was this regional support that came um, from the multiple communities that are along Highway 18, and then the broader support that uh, Senator Mullet talked about with legislators to seeing the impact um, from port traffic, you know, all of the, the trade that we see that goes across I-90 and 18 being a funnel, you know, from the warehouse districts up and from the ports. And so building that narrative and then having, um, you know, great kudos to our local governments that really came together and continually over the last um, few years came together making that their top priority for their regional transportation because it impacts the surface roads in each of these small towns too, right? I mean, it the traffic on 18 has a significant impact on the traffic on Issaquah and Front Street going right down, you know, Old Town Issaquah. So it's really, um, I do want to give a huge shout out to that, that regional effort by your local leaders that really helped us tell that story in the legislature and then came together to really make it it's you know the top priority for the region yeah you may not realize but your local mayors whether it's sean kelly down in maple valley or 
you know, Matt Larson or Catherine Ross and Sukwami, and, you know, we have Mary, Mayor Polly and Issaquah, McFarland and North Bend. I mean, they show up in Olympia and testify and it makes a huge difference. I mean, they do an, they are very engaged in what's happening and it's really powerful in a committee hearing to have all your local mayors from across your entire district talk about the importance of a project. It definitely moves the needle. Yep. All right. Thank you so much. Well, that pretty much does it for us tonight. Um, before we close, I just want to hand it back over to the members um, for just a last few seconds here for us. any um, final comments you may have. Um, we'll go in reverse order from the beginning. Rep Ramos, you want to start us off? Just thank you. Thank you for taking your time um, and, and joining us tonight. Thank you for every time you reach out to us and give us a concern uh, or an opportunity to work on something um, that is critical for you or even sometimes in your small community and sometimes statewide. I've, I've had constituents bring me uh, concerns that have turned into a statewide bill. Um, and that that is just the way things are supposed to work. So uh, I consider activism a, uh, a patriotic duty. And so when you when you step up, talk to share, do work, that's what matters in this country and in our state and making things good better. And and that's what it's all about. Thank you for that. You push us hard. Keep on us. That's what we're here for. Reach out anytime. We do want to hear from you on any any issue you have at any time. And sometimes just to, not even if you have an issue, just say hello. Love it. So thank you again. Well, and, and I'm going to take advantage of this opportunity. I do want to give a, a public thank you to Adam Day. He has been my legislative director my entire 10 years in the Senate. Uh, there's been a lot of turnover, a lot of staff down there. We have not had it in our office, but Adam Day is going to be moving on. <laughs> so <laughs> I only have Adam for about two more weeks. And I think the folks on this call who communicated with my office, I think you probably all experienced how smart Adam is and, and how devoted he is to this district. He grew up in Maple Valley, went to Tacoma High School. And uh, I just want to let Adam know that he's going to be missed. And, and we have a new Adam. His name is Connor. He's going to be starting <laughs> in a couple of weeks here. And, uh, so hopefully we'll have the same, you know, great response to the district as these questions come in. And and on Saturday, I promise I am I am bringing donuts. It's our first in person nice. town hall in a long time. I am bringing donuts to the town hall. Extra incentive if people want to <laughs> have double duty of us this week. <laughs> That's great. That's great. And, you know, a huge thanks to Adam. Adam has been a huge help to all of our offices and support and, and part of the team of the fifth and the fighting fifth and all that we do and making sure that we're responding and hearing from every constituent. And um, I know for both Bill and I, when we came into office and had brand new legislative assistants that also very much rock the world and, and what's happening, um, a huge part of that was, you know, Adam helping uh, to to start that whole setup up. So um, because of that, we have great, this really great partnership. And I just a huge thanks again to everybody for showing up. Looking forward to seeing those of you that want to see a repeat in person uh, showing up live on Saturday. I'm very anxious to do that. Certainly um, am hopeful that we'll be able to restart some of our uh, little community coffees um, that we've been able to do on and off um, in the past over the interim. So looking forward to that as well. So stay tuned to all of that work. Um, and uh, yeah, so we'll be connecting in many ways. And thanks for sharing your night with all of us. And thanks to my colleagues, Rep Ramos and Senator Mullet for uh, their deep work and passion and compassion during this last session and getting so much work done. All right, thank you all so much. All right, that is all the time we have for tonight. Thank you again for joining us this evening and for sharing your questions. Again, if we didn't get to your question or if you've thought of something you'd like to ask, don't hesitate to reach out to your members directly. Um, we've had their contact information show up a couple of times on screen and we will have it up as soon as this feed is over. Um, if you weren't able to catch the whole thing tonight, a recording of tonight's town hall will be immediately available uh, after the live stream ends. And and as a reminder, you'll also have the chance to join Rep. Callen, Rep. Ramos, and Senator Mullet in person this Saturday, April 30th from 10 to 11 a.m. at Tahoma High School in Maple Valley. Uh, and if for no other reason than to get some of Senator Mullet's donuts. Uh, thank you again and good night. <laughs>
Thank you. Good night. Good night.